Hi, I'm Eldrick Stoneskin, and the video essay that you're about to watch is part six in a series containing my theory surrounding the secret of the Winterfell crypts, and ultimately, the key to defending humanity against the coming onslaught of the others. I believe that Azor High, the hero of the first long night, was the male progenitor of House Stark, who was sacrificed, turned to stone with grayscale to become a statue, and then resurrected through the weirwood by the white-haired woman we see in Bran's vision at the origin of the Winterfell heart tree. This grey king then established the line of House Stark, who after ending the long night, built Winterfell to protect this sacred weirwood, while he and his warriors descended beneath the surface to sit a throne, becoming human statues to preserve their bodies for eternity, so they can wake again thousands of years in the future when the others return. And it just so happens there is one more myth about statues returning to life in the series that I think George is using to foreshadow these grayscale transformed kings of winter returning to life, seemingly with the help of a magical woman. And that is the legend of the Shrouded Lord, who is said to have been a statue that came to life, which is a story I think George has included in the series to cleverly foreshadow us stone lords beneath Winterfell who we think were shrouded in grayscale so they could become human statues and return to life as well. The first parallel George has included to suggest this idea is that another name we hear for the shrouded lord is his grey grace, which is a description that suggests him as a grey man reminding us of the Starks who are thought by Theon to have grey skin and grey eyes, and the Grey King, who we think was the progenitor of the Stark bloodline, and his grey skin and grey eyes as well. His grey grace is even said to bestow his grey kiss to people, which happens to be giving the recipient grey scale, and knowing this magical disease spreads simply through touch, it would make sense if the Shrouded Lord also had grayscale, with this contagious magical stone disease most likely being the reason his grey grace became a statue in the first place. Another interesting point is that when the Shrouded Lord bestows his grey kiss to someone, he's choosing this person who will become a statue from grayscale to ornament his stony court, presenting him as a stone lord with a group of human statues as a part of his court reminding us of the stony court of kings on their thrones beneath Winterfell and the Grey King's warriors who are blessed with stone and are seated on thrones in a court beneath the sea as well. It's also said that the Shrouded Lord, who we think was a grey-scaled man, was brought back to life with a kiss, reminding us of the kiss of life we see performed in the ironborn drowning ritual we discussed last video in which the participant is blessed with stone potentially meaning grayscale, before being resurrected with the kiss of life as well, giving us two examples of a person who has grayscale being resurrected through a kiss of life. And it just so happens, the kiss that brought this statue back to life was performed by a grey woman with lips as cold as ice, reminding us of Lady Stoneheart, the wife of a King of Winter character, her grey association, white hair, and her speech which is described as a stream as cold as ice. This grey woman who resurrected the Shrouded Lord with lips as cold as ice also reminds us of the Corpse Queen and her skin as cold as ice, who by no coincidence is associated with an ancient Stark in the Night King, which we'll discuss in my next and final video for the series. And I think these three parallel female characters with their icy symbolism are meant to parallel and inform us of the white-haired woman in Bran's vision that we think resurrected our Azor High character after he became a stone man through grayscale as well. It's also suggested that his grey grace, a man who had grayscale, lived for a thousand years, which is very similar to what we hear about the grey king who was blessed with stone, which I suggest is grayscale, and he's said to have ruled 
after a thousand and seven years, giving us two examples of people who underwent a grey transformation, most likely becoming human statues and supposedly lived extended lives. Another parallel between House Stark and the Shrouded Lord is that it's said his grey grace will grant a boon to any man who can make him laugh. Depicting the Shrouded Lord as being humorless and will grant a boon if he can be taught to laugh, which is interesting as it's well known the Starks are said to be humorless as well, with Robert even telling Ned in the crypts around onlooking stone statues that he could teach Ned how to laugh, just like the Shrouded Lord in this quote from A Game of Thrones. They say it grows so cold up here in winter that a man's laughter freezes in his throat and chokes him to death, Ned said evenly. Perhaps that is why the Starks have so little humour. Come south with me and I'll teach you how to laugh again. And this idea is potentially furthered by the name Stark as well, which can also mean having a sombre or joyless expression, furthering the connection between the Shrouded Lord and House Stark. And rather amazingly, we find that Stannis, an Azor High parallel character, who also undergoes a grey transformation and is described as being made of stone on several occasions, is also said to be humourless, needing to be taught how to laugh as well, just as we heard with Ned Stark and just as we heard with the Shrouded Lord, who grants a boon if he can be taught to laugh as well. With this boon, seemingly being his grey kiss, which he does not bestow lightly, giving the recipient grayscale so they can ornament his stony court as a human statue. Just as I'm suggesting happened to Azor Ahai and the first kings of winter, who became statues and are foreshadowed to reawaken from within the crypts. And if we look closer at the Shrouded Lord, we find more evidence to support this through the legend of Garen the Great who is said to have become the Shrouded Lord, risen again from his watery grave. At Croyane, the cage was hung from the walls so that the prince might witness the enslavement of the women and children whose fathers and brothers had died in his gallant, hopeless war. But the prince, it is said, called down a curse upon the conquerors, entreating Mother Royne to avenge her children. And so that very night, the ruin flooded out of season, and with greater force than was known in living memory, a thick fog full of evil humours fell, and the Valyrian conquerors began to die of grayscale. As you've just heard, after the killing and enslavement of Garen the Great's people, this Ruinar prince calls upon Mother Ruin, a magical water deity, to bring forth a curse which happens to be grayscale, reminding us of another magical water deity in the Drowned God, who is said to have the ability to change a being's bones to stone, and the gods of forest, water and stone that the children of the forest worship, which we think are one and the same, and also suggesting the idea that the magical white-haired woman in Bran's vision gifted grayscale from the magic of the gods of forest, water and stone as well. And if we look further at this legend, it just so happens that it's an army that has been turned to stone from Greyscale, who are said to be the Lords of Fire, both alive and dead beneath the water, having still not rested to this day. Reminding us of the Lord of Fire, Azor High, and his army, who we think were turned to stone using Greyscale by the white-haired woman while going beneath the green sea of the Weirwood and now sitting beneath the surface of Winterfell, having not rested to this day either which while we're on the topic, might also be why we see several strong symbolic hints of a dragon sleeping beneath Winterfell as well, not foreshadowing a literal dragon waking from the crypts, but Azor Ahai, a warrior of fire and symbolic dragon waking from the crypts, a lord of fire who was turned to stone with grayscale during the vision of two men and a woman in Bran's weirwood vision so they could have protective stone skin in order to preserve their bodies and defeat the others and end the Long Night. And amazingly, if we look to the Roynar's version of the Long Night hero, we also hear mention of a female and two males 
just as we see in Bran's vision, joining together to bring back the day. Lomas Longstrider in his Wonders Made by Man recounts meeting descendants of the Roinar in the ruins of the festival city of Croyane, who have tales of a darkness that made the Roin dwindle and disappear, her waters frozen as far south as the joining of the Selhoru. According to these tales, the return of the sun came only when a hero convinced Mother Roin's many children, lesser gods such as the Crab King and the Old Man of the River, to put aside their bickering and join together to sing a secret song that brought back the day. The first thing to note about this Roinar tale of ending the long night is that this water deity is referred to as Mother Roin, and the people that follow her are her children, implying this water deity as being worshipped by children, children who sing a song, much the same as we hear of the children of the forest, worshipping gods of stream or water who we know are referred to as singers as well. And this makes sense, as it sounds as if the children of the forest's magic, which would likely involve singing, was key in ending the long night in the northern stories we hear as well, just as the water goddess Mother Roin's children sing a song to bring back the day in the Roinar story too. And rather amazingly, one of the heroes of the Roinar long night, the old man of the river, happens to be described as a horned turtle. And knowing that this giant horned turtle sang a song to bring back the day, it's very interesting that his voice is described as a deep-throated thrumming roar louder than any war horn, giving this horned turtle who sung a song to bring back the day a voice which sounds like a horn, further foreshadowing the idea that the sounding of a horn is the key to ending the long night and bringing back the day. Just as I'm suggesting that the Horn of Winter is key in ending the long night, which in my opinion, when sounded, wakes giants in the earth that will assist in winning the battle for the dawn and bringing back the day. But what's more interesting is that this long night hero happens to be a turtle, which by no coincidence is George's favourite animal and personal sigil. And what characteristic do turtles have that set them apart from other animals? A hard protective shell, giving us a hero of the long night with a hard exterior meant for defensive purposes. Just as we've seen with our other long night hero parallel characters, symbolically described as stone, statues, or having hard skin, much as a means of defense as well. And this giant long night hero, by no coincidence, is also described as mottled, a common symbol we've seen around grayscale, which is described as mottled several times, potentially tying this giant long night hero with protective armor to grayscale yet again. And amazingly, the sound we hear coming from the old man of the river is described as roaring, which is the same description we hear used around the sound made by the Titan of Bravos, who also roars to hail the coming of the dawn, giving us two giant long night heroes with a hard exterior, roaring and sounding like horns to bring back the sun, which I think is foreshadowing the first long night hero as a giant being with protective skin who wakes from the blowing of a horn to bring back the day, a hero we think became a stone man beneath Winterfell to allow himself to be reborn again from the weirwoods thousands of years in the future. And if we look to the ruined city of Croyane, the Bridge of Dream, and the stone men we find upon it, we find more foreshadowing to support our theory. Croyane is a very interesting city that George shows us firsthand in the series, which in my opinion is meant to parallel the story of the Starks, who were once a happy family and are now broken apart, and also represent the castle of Winterfell, which has now become a broken and sorrowful place, and as we are about to see, is meant to foreshadow the idea of the stone men in the Winterfell crypts, who are essentially bypassing the laws of time 
by residing within the green sea of the weirwood so they can reawaken thousands of years in the future. The first thing to note as we float down the ruin is that we hear Tyrion and Yasilla discussing the idea of souls residing beneath the surface of the water here, which I think is representative of the souls within the green sea of the weirwoods waiting to rise up again. And it just so happens Tyrion points out one of these tortured souls as a giant stone man reaching up from beneath the surface of the river in this quote from A Dance with Dragons. There are restless spirits in the air here and tormented souls below the water. There's one now, said Tyrion. Off to starboard, a hand large enough to crush the boat was reaching up from the murky depths. Only the top of two fingers broke the river's surface, but as the shy maid eased on past, he could see the rest of the hand rippling below the water and a pale face looking up, giving us a giant stone man trying to rise up from beneath the surface, just as we expect to see happen at Winterfell, with stone giants rising up from beneath the green sea of the Weirwoods. In response to this, Yasilla refers to these tormented souls beneath the water as the Whispering Dead, once again associating stone men with whispering, just as we saw with Harlon Greyjoy, who was becoming a stone man from Greyscale and speaks only in whispers which I think is in reference to the language of the Weirwoods and the stone greenseers beneath the tree, communicating with the living from within the Weirwood. After this giant stone hand rising up from the depths, we are then shown a spiral staircase leading up out of the water into the air, reminding us of the spiral staircase that leads up from the depths of the crypts. After the spiral staircase, we're then shown a headless statue, which is described during the time loop as a headless hero, reminding us of Ned Stark, a King of Winter character who has become a hero to those he influenced after his beheading and is now immortalised as a statue in the crypts of Winterfell. The next parallel to Winterfell we're given is described by Tyrion as a tree with giant roots, with their size being described as bigger than the boat, which reminds us of the Winterfell Weirwood, which is described as having giant roots as well. We are then shown a broken tower, which I think is meant to remind us of the broken tower in Winterfell, which is literally referred to as the broken tower. And this giant stone tower happens to be symbolically staring at them with blind black eyes, giving us a giant anthropomorphized stone being staring with blind eyes, reminding us of the eyes of the giant stone kings of winter who are said to stare with blind eyes too. And just to hammer the symbolism home, George gives us another anthropomorphized stone tower only a few paragraphs later, when we see another stone tower described as being bearded with grey moss, bringing another giant stone structure to life by giving it a grey beard while also reminding us of the grey beard that the Grey King, a proto-Stark, is remembered to have had as well. And to really suggest that this scene is meant to parallel Winterfell, George gives us an instance here where a character thinks they see a dragon flying through the sky, with it disappearing very quickly, calling to mind the mysterious Winterfell dragon incident in which Bran also thinks he sees a dragon while skin-changing summer. In fact, even the symbolism George shows us around the stone men we see attacking Tyrion and company further suggests these stone men as representing the Stark stone men beneath Winterfell. Interestingly, we hear Tyrion actually describe the sound of one of these stone men as howling, reminding us of the symbolic wolves that the Starks are through their sigil and their warging abilities. And when Tyrion drives his shoulder into this stone man to knock him off the boat, he describes it as feeling like slamming into a castle wall. Which is interesting because as we know, the castle of Winterfell is described as a giant stone man too, furthering this connection. The next thing to note is that when discussing the stone men on the Bridge of Dream, Tyrion thinks to himself that stone eyes are blind eyes 
which is apparently true, as he then goes on to mention that blindness is common once grayscale has reached the face. But what's interesting about this is that the anthropomorphized stone kings of winter are constantly described as having blind eyes staring out into eternal darkness, or as having blind eyes that seem to follow them as they passed. Further connecting the stone men to our stone kings and suggesting the idea of these kings of winter being actual people who have been turned to stone with grayscale to become statues and preserve their bodies for thousands of years. But it's not just the giant stone men rising up, the spiral staircase, the headless hero statue, the broken tower, the anthropomorphic stone towers, and the mysterious dragon sighting that George is using to parallel Winterfell and foreshadow stone men rising up from the earth as the foreshadowing for our theory really kicks up with the Bridge of Dream and the stone men upon it. The Bridge of Dream sequence we witness while travelling down the ruin is one of the series' most magical events and shows us this structure and the stone men upon it somehow involved with travelling through time. And I think George is using the Bridge of Dream to represent a weirwood and foreshadow the idea of the weirwoods granting access through time for the stone men beneath them and the spirits within them. The first example that suggests the Bridge of Dream as a symbolic weirwood is that we find this bridge described as being made of pale stone, sounding like the pale wood of the weirwoods, which eventually become pale stone. And the fact that this pale stone structure is a bridge only furthers the Bridge of Dream as a symbolic weirwood, as the weirwoods seem to act as a bridge through time as well, a bridge I'm suggesting the Green Sea is utilised by sleeping within the weirwood for thousands of years in a state of limbo to be reborn in their stone bodies in the crypts. This is even suggested with this pale stone structure being named the Bridge of Dream, furthering it as an amazing symbolic representation of the weirwoods, which we think are harbouring the stone kings of winter whose bodies and minds are in an extended form of sleep within the heart tree at Winterfell. And amazingly, as if George is trying to hint that this scene involving the Bridge of Dream and its stone men is connected to Winterfell and its stone men, George describes the Bridge of Dream as pale stone archers marching off into the fog, giving us some very familiar language we've seen before, describing a symbolic stone army marching into the fog of the Long Night which is the exact same language George has used three times when describing the columns of the crypts of Winterfell as a symbolic stone army marching into the darkness too. And I think the reason for this is that George is using the Bridge of Dream and the grey-scaled stone men upon it who seemingly bypass the laws of time to symbolise and foreshadow the idea of stone men using the Winterfell weirwood to slip into a dream realm within the heart tree so they can reawaken 8,000 years in the future. Essentially giving these ancient stone men within the Winterfell heart tree the ability to more or less travel through time, just as we see with the stone men on the Bridge of Dream, which represents a weirwood, bypassing the laws of time as well. In fact, the river that this symbolic weirwood spans is even suggested to us as representing the river of time itself, when we hear Tyrion think that, I am travelling through years as well as leagues, Tyrion reflected, back through history to the days when dragons ruled the earth, suggesting this journey as travelling back through time, just as we see with the Bridge of Dream time loop. And amazingly, to connect all these ideas, we hear Bloodraven describe time as a river as well, while by no coincidence describing the ability of the weirwoods to not be affected by the river of time, just like the Bridge of Dream in this quote from A Dance with Dragons. For men, time is a river. We are trapped in its flow, hurtling from past to present, always in the same direction. The lives of trees are different. They root and grow and die in one place, and that river does not move them. 
just like the symbolic weirwood, the Bridge of Dream is not affected by the flow of the symbolic river of time, the Roin, and the reason we are shown stone men upon it is to foreshadow our grayscale transformed kings of winter who are using the weirwoods to shelter from the laws of time and rise again thousands of years in the future. And I think George is furthering this idea through the symbol of the moth, which we find around the description of these time-defying stone men as the crew approach the Bridge of Dream in this quote from A Dance with Dragons. The broad wooden span of the bridge had rotted through, but some of the lamps that lined the way were still aglow. As the shy maid drew closer, Tyrion could see the shapes of stone men moving in the light, shuffling aimlessly around the lamps like slow grey moths. Which is a very interesting and deliberate addition by George when describing the stone men we see involved with the manipulation of time while on this symbolic weirwood. Because amazingly, after Bran is given the weirwood paste by Snowy Locks in Bloodraven's cave and he communicates with Ned through the Winterfell heart tree, Bloodraven uses the symbol of the moth twice while explaining the weirwood's apparent timeless abilities in this quote from A Dance with Dragons. Men live their lives trapped in an eternal present, between the mists of memory and the sea of shadow that is all we know of the days to come. Certain moths live their whole lives in a day, yet to them that little span of time must seem as long as years and decades to us. An oak may live 300 years, a redwood tree 3,000, a weirwood will live forever if left undisturbed. To them seasons pass in the flutter of a moth's wing, and past, present and future are one. Symbolically tying the stone men involved in the time loop on the Bridge of Dream to the timeless abilities of the weirwoods, meant to foreshadow the idea of the stone men beneath the Winterfell heart tree who cheated death and time itself. And rather amazingly, Piat Pri uses this same symbol of the moth to describe the undying ones of Karth and their mysterious ability to seemingly bypass the laws of time as well right before Danny drinks Shade of the Evening, which is described as tasting exactly like Bran's weirwood paste, tying stone men in a time loop on the Bridge of Dream to the timeless weirwoods who have stone men beneath them and for some reason the undying ones of Karth who sit beneath Shade of the Evening trees appearing to Danny as a king and live for eternity as well. If you have any idea why, let me know in the comments below. And finally, if we go back to the shy maid who has just passed the Bridge of Dream and is about to experience the same scene for the second time, what is it that we learn in the middle of this time loop occurring? We learn that Tyrion has discovered young Griff isn't who he is said to be, but that he is in fact the son of Rhaegar Targaryen, who was smuggled away to keep safe from enemies as the hidden and true king of Westeros. And as the stone men attack the Shy Maid and one of them reaches for young Griff, we get this very interesting quote. The broken bone was speckled with brown blood, but still he lurched forward, reaching for young Griff. His hand was grey and stiff, but blood oozed between his knuckles as he tried to close his fingers to grasp. The boy stood staring, as still as if he too were made of stone giving us a character who is clearly meant to parallel Jon Snow, who is actually Rhaegar Targaryen's son, was also hidden away from the nobility of Westeros, actually should be the rightful king of Westeros, and if my theory is correct, will be turning to stone in the winds of winter. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Once again, I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone out there for supporting the channel so far. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you liked the video. And as always, I'd love to discuss your thoughts, ideas or additional evidence around this theory in the comments below. In the seventh and final part of this series, things are going to get a little wild, as I'm going to show my ideas on how the theory I presented in the first six parts 
might play out in the end game. I originally thought to leave this last part out as it involves a bit more speculative thinking than the previous six parts, but I'm more convinced of this final part of the theory after completing the series as a whole, and it's going to be very interesting to hear your thoughts. When we're going to look at Bran Stark, Hodor, the Three-Eyed Crow, and the Hammer of the Waters. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.